I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> How many people here know me? Great. And, um, and how many people here are um, health care providers of one sort or another? How many people here uh, manage land either as farmers or in some other way? Um, parents? <laughs> people who are caring for somebody else currently, not, not being paid for it? <laughs> Um, how many people here feel like um, that they worry that sometimes they are they might be a bother to somebody else? <laughs> we got a little, a little too much trouble. How many people here have trouble asking for help when you need? Year, then everyone has a lot to eat. If it's a slim year, no one does. 
but at least everyone has a little. In certain wilderness areas in the Ukraine, anyone can build a cabin to live in. Groups of people all over the world share non-material things as well. Languages, jokes, traditions, fairy tales, more recently the internet, Wikipedia, open source software. Gradually over the course of history, there's been an increasing privatization of commonly held resources. Rich growing areas, grazing areas, and forests have been carved up with ownership given to individuals, usually those who were in favor with the powers that be, rather than the people who had been using them communally for generations. This enclosure of the commons has implications that we're only beginning to understand. From the prairies of America to the steppes of Russia, guns and fences have stopped the migration of massive herds of wild grazing animals across the continents, as well as the predators that kept those herds from overgrazing in any one area. Once predator and prey were gone, we lost nearly everything that depended on their presence and movement. Grasslands, topsoil, soil organisms, soil fertility, carbon and water cycling, and biological diversity. All of these losses affect our health. The growth economy puts increasing pressure on natural resources as people try to find new things to sell. Landowners, communities, and even nations are selling mining, gas, and oil rights on their land. Now, even water rights are up for sale. On a global scale, as corporations use their financial influence to lobby for looser environmental regulations, we're quickly losing the most basic commons that we used to be able to depend on. A stable climate, sparkling clear underground aquifers, oceans full of fish, even the shapes of mountains. In the desperation of a faltering economy, people are patenting everything from ancient yoga poses to traditional seed varieties. Yet there have always been some people keeping an eye on the commons and making sure that certain parts of life do not get privatized. In Massachusetts, where I grew up, reservoirs of drinking water are shared by all who live near them, and we knew as children that we were expected not to swim in them. Here in Thetford, we have a town forest as a backup reservoir of firewood. Many things are still part of the commons, even in our capitalist economy with shared costs, governance, and upkeep, as well as widespread benefits. In neighborhoods, we share community gardens, playgrounds, athletic fields, public beaches, and houses of worship. In most communities, our schools, fire departments, buses, subways, libraries, parks, sewers, roads, reservoirs, sidewalks, police departments, postal service, trash collection, and more are all part of the public works or common good. Everyone benefits from having roads without potholes and working sewers, so everyone who can afford to pays for them one way or another. What we share in the United States seems normal to us, and we look down on cultures that don't have good public works. It seems strange, then, that so many Americans are threatened by the idea of making health care part of the commons. They struggle with the idea of nationalized or single-payer health care, thinking it would mean that the U.S. was socialist, or worse, communist. In the vast majority of developed countries, yes, capitalist ones too, healthcare is part of the commons, available to everyone, with the costs shared by all members of society. People who live in Europe, Asia, Canada, and other places where medical care is part of the public works look at our healthcare system with its varying rules, price structures, deductibles, paperwork, waiting periods, fees, and ways of excluding people who are actually sick and think it is bizarre. In countries like England that have a true national health service as opposed to requirements that all citizens buy private health insurance, no one deals with billing and insurance codes in the world of medicine. Patients don't, administrative assistants don't, and doctors don't either. Everyone involved can simply focus on giving and receiving care. It's hard to imagine, but it's a choice we could make in the United States. In countries like Cuba, where everyone has a primary care team living right in the neighborhood, free of charge and accessible at all hours, it seems just as normal to them as having a nearby fire department, 
available at any hour. No one in the United States ever suggests that we should not pitch in to pay for the fire department, because we all understand that any of us could need them at any time. The same is actually true of health care providers. How would you feel if your rich neighbors got firefighters to come right away, but your firefighter policy had a 10-hour waiting period and a $5,000 deductible? What if people who had already had a fire in the past were excluded by the fire department because of prior conditions? What if your poor neighbors couldn't afford the fire department's exorbitant fees at all? The simple truth is there's money to be made by keeping health care in the private sector. And, there are those, and those who are already invested in the healthcare industry are spending some of their profits making sure that things don't change. <coughs> if we gradually get trained to think that it is normal to pay for many things that in other cultures are part of the commons, including things like people helping each other, healing each other, massaging each other, playing with children, and caring for elders. For example, if you scare people away from touching each other without a license, there's more money to be made for those who are licensed, but there's a huge loss in the valuable social commons of warm, caring contact and healing touch. In theory, acknowledging a certain level of skill, experience, or training is a good thing, but when it is combined with a profit-driven competitive market, it can work against community-based values of people helping and trusting each other. The loss of the social commons of the social commons is an exponential problem. If most parents have been scared out of letting children play in the woods and have been convinced to pay for camps and after-school enrichment programs instead, then the child who stays home in the summers has no one to play with. There are no packs of roving children playing the brook at the edge of the field and woods, no stickball games in the street, so the bored child in the living room, whose parents can't afford camp, becomes a bother. So, so for the families that can't afford camps, there's another product to buy, video games that simulate playing. With some children in camps and others plugged into video games, the grandparent at home has less to do and less to contribute and starts to feel like they're a bother. So now an institution advertises that they will take care of our elders and suddenly it seems worth it. The more of a sense we have that our needs, our disabilities, and our illnesses are bothersome, irritating, or a drain on our friends and family, the more we are willing to pay someone to take care of us and the more normal we think it is to move people to nursing homes. The advertisements that promote healthcare institutions, as well as other service industries, such as hairdressers, therapists, dog walking services, and daycare centers, serve as a constant reminder that it is important not to depend too heavily on friends, family, and neighbors. skip ahead a little here. We tend to imagine health care as a world of unlimited technological, material, and economic resources, and very limited social resources. For example, we expect every hospital to have all the latest equipment, yet we can't ask our neighbor to give us a ride to the hospital. We think it's normal when a doctor's visit lasts only a few minutes, yet we expect to go home from that visit with prescriptions for multiple medications. As we start to understand the challenges of a failing growth economy, dwindling natural resources, supply chain interruptions, and increasing numbers of expensive natural disasters, we might want to start look, looking at healthcare the other way around, to understand that there are limits to certain material resources, but there are plenty of untapped skills, knowledge, caring, and other social resources that we can access. Okay, here's a little story and then we'll have a little discussion. This is called How Sharing a Washing Machine Saved Lorraine's Life. For the first summer that the boys and I lived in the clinic, 
We didn't have a stove, a shower, or a washer and dryer. All those appliances had been removed when I bought the building and turned it into a multi-practitioner clinic back in 1998. My neighbor Lorraine told us that until we saved up enough money to buy new appliances, we could simply use hers. The previous year I'd treated the painful, drug-induced peripheral neuropathy that left her dragging her legs around, barely able to use a walker. I had suggested she stop taking the statin drugs that I suspected were causing the de deterioration of the cholesterol-rich nerve sheaths in her legs, and encouraged her to reduce sugar, take a supplement called CoQ10, and add more grass-fed steak and butter to her diet. Her good cholesterol soared, her triglycerides dropped, her pain and weakness went away, and she was able to walk again. She might have felt she owed me a favor, but really her offer to share her home with us reflected something deeper. A working class value of sharing resources and labor passed down from generation to generation in her family. Her father, Floyd, had been one of my first patients and was the quintessential Vermonter who knew how to do everything. From raising cows and sheep on a tiny house lot in the village by grazing them in his neighbor's backyard. He wasn't phased by the odd manners of the wealthy flatlanders and trustafarians and hippies who moved to town. He helped my Harvard-educated father-in-law buy sheep at the local auction and helped him round them up whenever they got out. He taught me about edible weeds and entertained my two-year-old son when I first started seeing patients, propping him in his kitchen window to watch the dump trucks across the way. Lorraine, at 65, is much like her father, resilient. She single-handedly re raised a ridiculous number of kids some belonging to her, some belonging to a man who left her in a trailer with no running water. She's capable of fixing a computer in the morning, editing the minister's sermon at lunchtime, talking a young person out of a suicidal depression in the afternoon, and in the evening, recaining a chair using fresh cut cattails from the swamp next to the school. All this is somewhat surprising because she's bent over from spinal problems has frequent dizzy spells and almost total hearing loss, all from a near-fatal bout of meningitis when she was a baby. For years, the kids and I had already shared Lorraine's television, watching baseball games together in her living room, but now this relationship deepened. We cooked supper and ate together most nights. I took showers there when I needed to wash my hair, and I was in and out doing laundry nearly every day. In return, I did a variety of favors for her, driving her to the market, picking up her mail, and giving her acupuncture in her living room. One day, when I was there doing laundry, I noticed that she was in bed sleeping. Not unusual for her, but when I went back a few hours later, she was still sleeping. I put my hand on her arm and gently shook her. Her arm was hot, much hotter than it should have been, and she groaned when I touched her. Lorraine, I said again. She groaned again. She was barely able to speak. I called her sister and then called 911. She ended up being hospitalized for a week. She had a bad infection and was seriously dehydrated. The doctor said if she hadn't gotten to the hospital that day, she might well have died. That was when Lorraine and I realized the value of the arrangement we had made. Together, we decided that I should not get a washer and dryer. Instead, I would keep doing laundry at her house so that we would have the kind of regular connection that the rhythm of daily chores creates. <laughs> Lorraine has always enjoyed bartering for things. She once convinced the famous writer to trade her large field stones for donuts. But our arrangement is not just about the barter of laundry and television for my looking in on her. It's not even just about care. Our arrangement is about human contact, something Lorraine knows the value of on the deepest possible level. When her first child was born prematurely, the hospital told her he was not going to make it. Well then, I'm going to take him home, she said. The hospital resisted, but she was fierce. He's my child, and I'm not going to have him die all alone in a hospital. They gave in and handed her the infant. 
She took him home and rigged up a makeshift sling that kept him right next to her skin. She hadn't read the research that shows that marasmus, or failure to thrive, is a life-threatening medical condition in infants that is known to be treatable by human contact. But she knew the right thing to do. She carried him around for days, and the days turned into weeks, and soon he was thriving. Fifty years later, he is now one of the handsomest men around, six foot two, a strong carpenter. Sometimes when I have had a really hard day, I look across the street and see that Lorraine's light is on, and I walk over. I've come to love that dark, quiet stretch of road between our two houses late at night, long after the traffic has finally quieted down. As I walk over, I can hear the distant sound of the waterfall under the covered bridge. Lorraine is usually reading in bed. I bring in her hearing aid from the paper cup she puts it in in the kitchen at night and hold it out. She stares at me while she puts it in and turns it on, seeing if she needs to read my lips, but I'm silent. Oh, for goodness sake, she says, when she sees my eyes welling up with tears. She pats the quilt next to her. Get over here and tell me what happened. <laughs> I climb in next to her, start talking, and feel my body relaxing into the warmth of another human being. It is ancient and powerful medicine. So, <laughs> what I would love for people to do is to turn to someone that you don't know and to talk about a memory of a time when someone was really there for you, kind of unexpectedly, a time when someone supported you really well, listened to you really well, maybe a time when things were hard for you, and just what, what was the experience? What did they do? What did it look like? And the way we're gonna do this um, so that you don't have to worry about whether you're bothering somebody or they're bothering you. <laughs> Is that I'm going to tell you when to switch. So, <laughs> so, so one person will talk first and the other will listen. And then I'll give a little yoo-hoo into the mic. And then the other person will talk and the other person will listen. And if you don't have something that you want to say, that's okay. You don't actually have to say anything, but somebody's going to pay attention to you for about a minute, and that will be fine. We get, we get this as a practice for both sides.
they left us with someone who cleaned our house. And while they left us, um, the Detroit riots happened. And this woman, remember on the phone, telling her children, and I, I just, we just talked about it, so it really came, came vivid in my memory. She was talking to her 16 children about how they could survive in a burning city. And I was 10, but yet she told me that she wasn't gonna leave me, she was gonna protect me. And it gave me um, the ability to see across race and to see this, this aspect of love I mean, as a kid, I didn't know about race, but I knew that we were white and rich, and she was black and poor, and I knew that. But this action showed me that we're really all the same, and it's helped me, because I do a lot of third world, world travel, and it's really helped me um, see the other, that we're all one. And that was an early lesson. And I remember I did not tell my parents when I came home. <laughs> I knew they weren't ready to have this chair for them. Ten years ago, I got a chronic case of Giardia and didn't understand why the normal treatment didn't work. Um, and nonetheless, started grad school um, honoring the life purpose of biodiversity, service to the more than human world of biodiversity conservation that I grew up with as an only child. I'm a schooler, a tiny cabin out in the woods um, without electricity or running water. And um, figured that I needed to have the accreditation of grad school to do that work. So. Did undergrad here at Marlboro instead of staying for U of institutions and went up to grad school at UVM. And shortly after I came back from doing Jaguar prey work in Belize, um, I came back for, I guess, a Thanksgiving break and brought my friend, fellow Marlboro student, who was also um, a grad student with me at UVM. Um, we didn't have a car, we came back down to reconnect with the community here during our break. And something about returning back to a place where I knew everybody, um, but where I felt like I, I could see everybody thriving and shining and still being themselves in an evolving form and that I was unable to do that and I had lost much of who I was, the realness, broke me. And while we were walking together to visit a friend um, down the road, um, I was just sort of suddenly crushed by grief out of nowhere. And I don't think I could have sort of let that out and, and processed that in any full way without his presence. And it certainly couldn't have sort of transformed into a you know, positive experience of grieving um, without him. And it was simply being together and reconnecting in place and habitat um, that brought that forward. A more general question: What what is the quality of attention that that the person you're thinking about gave you? What what? How did you know that they were doing a good job? Was personally it was personal. Directed. Okay. Uh, hang on. It was personal. It was personal. Yeah. It, they were directed it to. To me, not abstractly, but meeting me where I was at that time. Okay, and over here? Um, it was unconditional. It was unconditional. Oh, Nancy, can you give me that mic? Why have you more to say? It was unconditional. Okay. And can you say how you could tell it was unconditional? What were they it's doing? It's not something you can put into words, you know it when you see it. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. They, they dropped what they were doing to attend to me. They dropped what they were doing to attend to me. Someone over here? I was in the oh. same. Yeah. What else? Completely unexpected. Out Completely of unexpected. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Giving full attention. Giving full yeah. attention. How could you tell they were giving full attention? She never looked at anything else but me. She never looked at anything else, but she was good eye contact. Good eye contact. Mm -hmm. Very simple and plain. 
Very simple and plain. Say, say more about that. Plain like a glass of water is plain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Without any embellishments or judgments or explanations or nothing. So There's nothing but simple sympathy. Simple sympathy, yeah. Yeah, no judgments, I heard you say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have a problem with people who are judgmental. <laughs> people talk about that as if it's a huge problem, but we need discernment as human beings. Mm -hmm. But in this state of attention one to another, a simplicity is important. Yes. Yeah. What else? Kind of the combination of being real with some other things that people have said, dropping everything, and like I can see on their face that they're genuinely pleased with me, um, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. like they're smiling and their eyes are bright. So um, it would be for me um, where someone trusted my process, meaning that they nice. weren't there to fix it and offer. Yeah, fix it tools, but they were there just to trust my process and know that this is where I was, and they were gonna they were gonna just listen and, and accept where I was at that particular time. Yeah, that's a really that's a really key piece of trusting the other person's mind <coughs> to figure it out. I think one of the things that we do when we um, are put in the spot of of providing care when we maybe weren't <laughs> expecting it is. Uh, we feel like we have to do something about it um, as opposed to trusting the other person to figure it out, but that they actually just need another person there to witness that or to lean against or to maybe do the dishes while they're figuring it out or whatever to figure out what, what's most useful for them. Um, but trusting that person's mind is important. One of the reasons that's so important is that our... Our mental health system is set up in a way that uh, we don't actually really trust other people's minds to figure out what's, you know, what they need to do. And so, um, so our, our culture around that has developed into a lot of naming of conditions, uh, whereas you know, what you could call clinical depression, I would just call heavy discouragement. You know, <laughs> or a, uh, anxiety disorder is sometimes shyness or some fear, the leftover fear from some old experience. Um, so the mental health system has is ready to jump in often with uh, drugs or with someone else whose <coughs> job it is to get paid to listen to you, which there are times when those things may make sense because we don't, we haven't figured out as a community yet how to provide this kind of attention. But one of the things they've seen in other countries is that if, for example, uh, the, someone who's having what the mental health system would call a psychotic break or a first incidence of schizophrenia, if that person is put with someone who has excellent attention or a team of people in a house and it's safe and they're given as much attention as they need to process what they're going through and nobody's worried about them, that the, the, the usual conclusion of that is that they never have that kind of experience again. That's so foreign to our mental health system. That, I mean, we are so scared about so-called mental illness that we will do almost anything to avoid it. And when you combine our fears about going crazy with a profit-based healthcare system, you have a real mess on your hands. So we have drugs that are very high profit-making drugs, uh, and we have a group of 
kind of sometimes scared people trying to figure out what to do with the people around them, um, being told that this is the answer. If we didn't have the profit motive there, I think that it would be a very different picture. So um, I'm going to just read a little bit from that section of the book. This book covers, as Patsy said, a lot of different territory. Um, and because, because the talk is about the commons of care, I'm focusing on this, but there are, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about climate change and Cuba and all kinds of cowboys, <laughs> all kinds of other things. So this is a chapter called, Who Defines Normal? Rediscovering Our Inner Compass. Partly because of pharmaceutical marketing tactics, the reported incidence of mental illness is escalating wildly. In 1950, many adults had lived through World Wars I and II and the Great Depression <coughs> and were facing the looming threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. So it is a little surprising that only 1 in 10,000 adults were thought to have depression. This incidence was so low that when the first antidepressant was made that year, there was little interest in marketing, marketing the drug. But by 2005, after a slate of new antidepressants had exploded under the market, researchers estimated that 1 in 5 adults had had a depression-related mood disorder at some point in their lives. This is over a 2,000-fold increase. In his article, The Art of Branding a Condition, written for a medical marketing magazine, Vince Perry notes, no therapeutic category is more accepting of condition branding than the field of anxiety and depression, where illness is rarely based on measurable physical symptoms and is therefore open to conceptual definition. After the pharmaceutical company GlaxoSmithKline hired a public relations firm to market Paxil for shyness in 1999, the appearance of the phrase social anxiety in the press rose from about 50 to more than 1 billion mentions in just two years. Shyness became the third most common mental illness in the US, and the advertising campaign for Paxil as a drug for shyness picked up an award for the best campaign in the United States. <laughs> One out of four women in the United States is currently on some sort of psychiatric medication. Abilify, an antipsychotic, is the number one best-selling drug in the United States among all medications, not just psychiatric medications. Mental disorder, uh, let's see. Each time I hear about another child at our local school who's been put on Ritalin, I cringe. In my own practice, I address so-called attention disorders by giving patients attention <laughs> and, <laughs> and dietary and lifestyle suggestions and by prescribing a lot of connection to the natural world. But mostly, I help to reframe the issue in broader social and anthropological terms. Mental disorders are largely defined by the cultural and social values that surround us. In the 1800s, so Southern doctors used the term drapetomania to describe the mental illness afflicting black slaves who desired to escape to freedom. And homosexuality was considered a mental illness by the American Psychiatric Association until 1973. Likewise, attention deficit disorder may well be one of those terms that reveals more about our sedentary, repetitive school culture than it says about the children who are being labeled and medicated. In 2012, 20 times more children were on addictive amphetamine-based drugs for attention disorders than 30 years before. Drugs like Ritalin and Adderall are often prescribed during an office visit with the suggestion to see if it helps with focus, as if response to the drug was a diagnostic criterion. The drugs do typically help with the kind of focus needed for repetitive tasks for a time, 
but that would be true of any stimulant, like coffee, for almost anyone trying it for the first time. The benefits of stimulants soon wear off, though, leaving only side effects and an addiction to the drugs. If children pull off the drugs and feel worse, the same odd logic is used. This, parents are told, is an, an indicator that the children need the drugs rather than being a normal symptom of withdrawal from a stimulant. So, people who are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD have brains that are hardwired to search for new and interesting things. We scan the horizon looking for patterns. Yes, me too. We zoom in on details that stand out or don't fit. We often perform well when there's a crisis going on, but slack off when things are more calm and start hunting for interesting snacks in the cupboard instead. We tend to be systems thinkers, seeing not just the elephant, but the whole herd and the forest, and we can come up with solutions that are outside the box. It's not that we curious and energetic types don't have the ability to pay attention, because with certain activities that involve a lot of novelty, like starting new companies, making art, or hunting for edible mushrooms, or writing long books about everything, we can, <laughs> we can go into hyper-focus mode for hours, days, or weeks. The issue is we get bored easily with certain types of repetitive activities, like washing dishes, memorizing multiplication tables, or sitting in classrooms. Being in school to people like us feels like being a hunter-gatherer stuck in a farmer's life. <coughs> Recent neuroscience re research shows that the genetic variation associated with people who are diagnosed with attention disorders in our agriculturally based society actually correlates strongly with the genetic makeup and lifestyles of hunter-gatherers. The same genetic variation occurs more frequently in nomadic, popula nomadic populations, and it works to your advantage health-wise if you happen to be born into a nomadic tribe. Not so if you are born into an agricultural society with our more scheduled, linear, indoor culture. Meanwhile, drugs such as Ritalin create long-term changes in the brain, similar to, and sometimes greater than, the effects of cocaine use, creating more sensitivity to stressful circumstances, increased anxiety, more tendency toward depression, and large increases in learned helplessness. Giving curious, energetic, innovative children drugs that create learned helplessness is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing, particularly as we enter an era in which we all, in which interesting and innovative solutions will be essential and we will all need to pitch in. Okay. Yeah, how many people here know someone who's on Riddle? Um, so, um, again, was that a comment in the back? Or? Question? Yes. Everything you've just said about ADD, ADHD, um, and suggesting that things like diet are helpful to correct or help it, has left out a physical, um, actual event occurrence that has been linked to ADD, ADHD. Um, and that is that although there may be a uh, brain uh, tendency toward it yep. in the human being, toward in one individual, that it's drawn out by trauma by the time the Thank child you. is four yes. or five years old. Thank you for bringing that up. So when I say that, that the thing that I find most important in, um, in addressing it <coughs> is attention. When we say attention deficit disorder, I do actually think it is attention deficit disorder. And that, and that the root of it often gets, as you say, drawn out or the genetic tendency gets triggered by trauma. And I, and I believe that and I have seen that. And, um, and my, I, I, my sense of what works there from both in my own life experience as a trauma survivor uh, and, in, and in treating 
children and adults for this is that is that it is still attention, contact with the outdoors, dietary things that help to soothe and smooth out blood sugar levels. Um, that that is that is how I would treat uh, trauma history as well as ADHD. But what about coming to terms with the trauma itself? Yes. So when I say attention, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about giving the person a chance to, as we were saying earlier, to process it and to trust that given enough attention, they will be able to process it. And and there's a there are a lot of wonderful new um, methods of listening out there, both ones that you can pay for and ones that you don't have to pay for, that that help with that in terms of in terms of understanding that the the physical and the emotional and the mental um, are all very deeply connected. So and 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 that trauma is passed down from generation to generation. That it isn't that even if it didn't happen to you, if it happened to your ancestors, that we will still can still have those echoes of that in our behavior, in our attitudes, etc. So thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I, I actually believe that most illness is really, a, is really an unhealed trauma, either physical trauma or, or mental or emotional trauma. And that until we learn how to deal with that in the moment and over the long term, that, that we're really not addressing illness. So we're just patching the symptoms. So what does a child do naturally when something bad happens. If there's if there's a loving parent or grandparent or caregiver around and something very harsh happens in the playground either by accident or on purpose, what does the two year old or the one year old naturally do? Cry. Cries. But do they do they instantly cry? They, they they actually don't usually instantly cry. They first they seek comfort, right? So they go, they find a warm, caring body that they trust is going to hold them in a way that is comfortable for them. Then they cry. <laughs> and then what happens? Let's hope they're soothed. Let's hope they're soothed. So, so if, they, if, they, if they can cry for long enough, what do parents or other people, depending, I don't want to be down on parents. We all do this, but <laughs> what do we tend to do when someone's crying? Really, 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 really loud, like in the supermarket. <laughs> That's what we say. Shh, right? Okay. Well, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, 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 okay. okay. Here, do you want something to eat? Do you want a toy? Do you want this? Do you want that? <laughs> we, so we're actually just suppressing it. Um, what the body needs to do in order to, to relax out of that adrenaline stress response is to just is to cry as long as they need to cry. They don't need a lollipop. They don't need a distraction. They don't need somebody to tell them to be quiet. They don't need somebody worrying about what other people think. They just need to cry it out. And the same is true for adults, and that's where we go wrong. We think that that it's fine for a two-year-old to cry, maybe, um, but but if, if one of us cried that loud, I mean, think about the last time you heard someone real offer in the supermarket. <laughs> if we did that in the supermarket, what would happen? They'd call the cops. They would call the cops. And, and then what would the cops do? Starts laughing and keeps laughing for too long. 
and doesn't stop laughing, doesn't stop laughing, right? Put him away. So, so yeah, so it's, what? Yeah. They're manic, yes. So, um, people do sometimes have feelings that are pretty hard to, to watch and to be there for. Um, and I would suggest that as part of creating a commons of care, that you get used to the idea of grown-ups laughing as hard as kids can laugh, crying as hard as kids can cry, blushing uncontrollably, trembling from head to foot like your dog does after it gets scared, and, th and to see this that these are all normal physiological responses for the body to get rid of stress. If you had a community in which everyone was comfortable with that, you would have a very, very physically and emotionally healthy community. So there's your homework. <laughs> Whatever it is, so it's not a matter that everything, all the rules are going out the window. It's that people 